Dunlap is kind of the definition of small town America. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world, in my opinion. I knew when I was getting close to home because you could look out the window and see nothing but a carpet of green. Any time of year, just about. Everybody that I know of has been born and raised here. I moved away for about a month and came right back. You know, you got your Friday night football, dirt track racing, and drag strip. It's part of life here. It's a quiet place until you look around. Whoever got that close to my dad, he knew that. He had to know who it was. I don't think he realized what type of person he was dealing with. My mind was reeling so how she knew he had passed away. You got a weird love triangle going on. Well, I'm pretty sure it's love. So I thought, what if this guy gets away with one murder? Would I be the next person he comes after? At that point in time, we're trying to determine who's telling us the truth. See you tomorrow. Okay, good deal. <laughs> Nine years ago, like in 2011, that was the first time he's ever seen anything like that in this area. It was a normal Thursday morning. Went to the local store here in town and bought breakfast. I, around 10 o'clock that morning, I received the call that was really upsetting. County 911. What's the problem? Well, ma'am, I was walking being against, and I think I've seen a body floating. I'm not for sure, but, but I mean, I just had to out running. Okay, do not hang up, okay? I want to get some more information from you. Well, okay. I, I won't be in trouble, but I ain't. I, well, no, 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 no. I just need to get some information from you. Okay. Hold on. I work scenes where it's uh, people I went to school with or friends of the family. As soon as you get the call, you wonder who it's gonna be. We get to the bridge. I was the first one there, so I walked down to the sink. Sure enough, as you crest the hill and make the curve, you can see what appeared to be a body floating there. He was a larger male. He had no ID on him. We checked his pockets, he had nothing. So he was just a John Doe to us at that time. As soon as we figured out that he had a uh, gunshot wound to the head, it was then to start determining whether or not he had shot himself, committed suicide, or if he was murdered and put there. The body was wearing a orange t-shirt with the name Fuzzy's Bar on it, which is a small uh, biker bar here in town. With him wearing a local bar shirt, we assume at that point in time that he's gonna be from around the area. I went ahead and called DA Steve Strain, let him, Steve know we, we got a body in the river. When I got to the scene where the body was, the uh, deceased was still in the river. You know, there, was, there was beer cans, there was all kinds of items around the, where the body was located. He was in shallow water and he's hung up on the rocks where he's at, so the body stayed in a fixed location. If they'd gotten the body out in the water where it drifted, the body may or may not have been found for 30, 60 days from the, from the homicide before the body was found. As we walked through together, we noticed the, the tire impressions. We didn't know at the time if they were related or not, but if this was a dump site, then somebody's had to transport the body in here. It, it appeared that there were drag marks that led to the water's edge. It looked like somebody picked him up and were dragging him. There was foul play involved in this case, and this man didn't put himself in the water. One of the first things we wanted to do is talk to the guy that was picking up cans at the river and just happened to find the body. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. Can Sorry. you give me your name? My name is Larry. Larry. Oh, Lord, no. Okay, just hang on. You didn't do anything wrong, okay? Still there? Yes, ma'am. Larry had been in our community for a while. Did he bring the body to the scene? 
Did he drop him off in the water and then call 911 so he don't look like he's a suspect? We took photographs of his impressions of his shoes so we would know that if his shoe impression was closer to the water than he said he was, we would be able to come back to him and ask him why. Larry's story started matching up with what he started telling us. You could tell the areas he had walked, and once he saw the body, you could tell he got out of there pretty quickly. Larry, at that point, we did, was more of a witness than he would be anything else to us. After we processed the scene, one of the patrolmen said he had answered a call earlier that morning. And that was very suspicious to us. Clutch County 911, where is your emergency? Um, I don't really have an emergency. I just went down beneath my house to do some work on my property. Mm -hmm. And somebody had pulled the car in there and burned it to the ground last night. It looks really suspicious, meaning like somebody drove it in there and set it on fire. We think maybe they're in links, you don't know. Um, so we go to work the scene at that real quick just to look at it and see if we can see anything. The car was just completely gone. There was no tires, no nothing. It was already completely burned up. While we're working it, patrolman notices a handicap placard, which is burnt but not completely burned up. And we can see a little bit of numbers. Once we ran the placard, we found out who owned the car. A person by the name of Clifford Carden Jr. Well, none of us knew him. And you pretty much know a lot of people in the community. Mostly everybody knows somebody between the whole department. Um, and he was not known to none of us. We got his driver's license information and looked at his picture. Because the body had been in the river for about 15, 16 hours, he was still unidentifiable. This is the first time I ever shared the story, basically with anyone. I remember meeting Jody Lockhart and some of the others in the police department. I identified a cliff by his tattoos, but I broke up when I seen him laying there. Cliff, I believe, was 17 when I, I met him. His mom and I had been married a little while, and he started referring to me as dad. He was as much a son to me as, as I could have had, I guess. The day we got the call that Cliff had been killed was a shocker. And it was totally blown us away because we didn't expect nothing like that. There was no problems that he was having with anyone that we knew about. It was just simply a beastly killing. I was five when my mom and Cliff married. And he raised me like his son from that point forward. They ended up getting a divorce, but the only person that I know is dad, and I will always call my dad, is Cliff. Once we identified who Mr. Carden was, we wanted to search Mr. Carden's residence. We know he's been dumped into the river, but we don't know where the murder scene may be at. So we want to go to his house, try to discover if, he, if there's any evidence there. We pull up at night, uh, so there's no lights on. You could obviously tell no one's home. We make entry through the back door into the residence. And once we get into the residence, we can tell that someone had been there prior to us being there. The residence had been put in disarray. Also, we noticed that a propane tank was put against a wall heater. This was set up to try to burn uh, Cliff Carden's residence. You have a propane tank laying on its side to where if the heater would have kicked on, it would have melted the plastic and burnt the carpet. And then it had kindling from the wood of the uh, dinner table. The killer's trying to destroy the evidence. So here I am, getting my son ready for bed. Get a phone call. 
and it's my dad's second wife, Cindy. Cindy's exact words to me were, your dad is dead. Given his health history, I was afraid he had had a heart attack. Of course, my mind was reeling on the ride up to my dad's house to meet police officers on, on scene, trying to figure out how she knew he had passed away. Because Cindy and my dad had been split up almost a year to the day. They were split up and they just had not legally been divorced yet. We arrived at my dad's house. There was police officers on, on scene. There was uh, investigators there. And Cindy was there. Me and Cindy never had a relationship of any kind. I mean, it was more of a um, of an acquaintance. While at my dad's house, Cindy turned and looked at everybody in the room and said, you know this all belongs to me because we're still married. And I, proceeded, I, I stood there and I looked at her in awe. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I proceeded to walk down the hallway to go to my dad's office, and Cindy got in front of me and wouldn't let me in there. I'm like, what are you doing? She goes, you don't need to be in there. So I made it a point to push her out of the way, and I walked in there. When I flipped the light on, I could tell then that there were things missing out of that room. That was a huge Dell Earnhardt van. Dad had the Dell Earnhardt 118 scale porcelain car, the Oreo car that the Earnhardt got killed in, okay? So Dad had that sitting right behind his desk, on a stand, everything. But it was gone. You could see where it had been. You could see that it was gone. And um, that's when I knew something was wrong there. Why would you prevent somebody from seeing that? Unless you had something to hide yourself. Sequatchie County deputies and TBI agents spent Thursday along the banks of the Sequatchie River collecting clues that at the time showed obvious signs of murder. I was actually here at work when I found out about the murder of Cliff Garden. When you've got something like a murder that has happened, uh, it's, it's definitely the buzz. You'll see tables talking across to each other and people you know, tossing around possibilities of who did it or why did they do it. This whole dining area is just one big conversation. A bunch of old people every day would come in and sit around. We had a table. I've been always talking about cars, uh, rebuilding cars, and I just knew him as coming here every day, getting coffee. He seemed to be like a laid-back guy. Seemed like he didn't bother anybody. I was working, and I was coming up where the East Valley Road, where the bridge is, where the cliff is found. And I seen all the police cars, and I thought, what in the world? You know, I hated it for his family and him and done well. At Fuzzy's, I started out at $4 an hour and eventually bought the business. Cliff, he came in almost every day and he was one of the ones that would always buy around. If somebody asked for help, he would give it. He always had cash on hand. I worried about him getting taken advantage of. I would tell him sometimes, Cliff, you don't need to do that. Once we released the information of the homicide to the news media, we received a tip from a local business owner. He advised that two days prior to Mr. Carden's body being found, Mr. Carden was actually at his store. He overheard Cliff Carden have a phone conversation with someone who Mr. Carden described as an ex-girlfriend, and that Cliff was very upset over the phone call, slammed the phone down. Mr. Carden then told the owner of the store that the ex-girlfriend and her new boyfriend had tried to run him off the road. Was this ex-girlfriend, Sidney Carton? From the time that I met my dad, he was always underneath the hood of a car. No matter what you put in front of him, he could work on it and take care of it, put it back together. The smell of it inside the shop reminds me of my dad more than anything else on the, in the world. 
I mean, working on a car is a physical job. My dad did have back problems because of his weight. And so he took prescription drugs for his back problems. I miss him a lot of times, too, now. He's, he was always there if you needed him. I was proud of him in that. He'd done good. If he wasn't working on a car, he wanted to be around his grandkids. My youngest was um, one at the time. And uh, it breaks my heart to know that Kobe will, will never know who he is, never is, never get that uh, that grandfather teddy bear, big teddy bear from, from him. He'll never know that. My dad would always say that, you know, yeah, me and Cindy are having problems. At the time that I started to suspect Cindy, I, I didn't know what, what, what would be the purpose. Dad didn't have anything. What are you going to get out of it? And then it came to light that she thought that he had a $50,000 life insurance policy. She got upset when the, when the funeral director told her that he only had one life insurance policy of $10,000. And she said, well, what about the $50,000? She said, apparently he canceled that months ago. There was rumors, speculation, talk everywhere. You'd hear, well, everybody knew he always carried money. It's a wonder it didn't happen before. He was a generous man. He still talked to a strange wife and tried to help her. It struck me that maybe she was interested in getting back together, but maybe she didn't get what she was supposed to from Cliff. We want to talk to Sydney's quick as we can. We want to know if they are on separated but on good terms. We want to know if she's involved. She was not a primary suspect, but you got to make sure you don't get trapped in on uh, theories or ideas. You just focus on what your evidence is and where your evidence takes you. I know there's more to the story than what has been found out. My suspicion was still with Cindy and that she was the one that pulled the trigger. We found out that there was a life insurance policy that Cindy thought she was a beneficiary on, that she was going to receive a lot of money. We wanted to sit down with Cindy and talk to her and get uh, a statement from her and find out what she did know and when was the last contact she had. During the uh, interview of Cindy Carden, she gave us an alibi of where she was uh, at the time before Clifford Carden's murder. She said she was at Laurel Brooks Hair Salon and then later she went home. Both of those were, inter were followed up and verified. We determined that she was not involved in the uh, death of Mr. Carden at all, and her alibi was airtight. His sense of humor was great, Ben. He was so funny. He could tell jokes, and I think he'd just make them up. <laughs> I never dreamed that I would ever be a suspect. They asked me where I was and what time I was here, what time I was there, and I could give them every single one of the answers that they wanted to know. Chris was pointing his finger at me. He blames me for things, but just between me and you, there's bad blood there. 1988, and I'm a single mom raising two kids, and I get a tap on the door where my friend had said that somebody wanted to meet me. So when I opened the door, ooh, he was so good looking. I was trying so hard to smear that on his face. <laughs> we got married on Valentine's Day, February the 14th. We were together for 23 years, and I'll never get that hug again. My separation from Cliff was in 2011. I just needed time to think and I moved out. That was the hardest thing I ever had to do. We were just drifting apart. I was the last person to talk to him 
he calls me up and I talk to him and his, he tells me, you know, if my car's not there, don't worry, I'll be back. And I didn't see his car, so I just kept going. <laughs> he had so many lady friends, you know, that he would talk to and do their car. For all I know, it was one of his old clients that he had worked on their vehicle for. Only like a few months before Cliff's death, he went to Daytona with some other lady from Fuzzies. Had his picture made with her on the beach. And she's wearing my jacket. Dale Earnhardt jacket. Well, maybe they were just friends. Yeah. Believe what you want. <laughs> when we found Cliff's um, body in the river, and the shirt that he was wearing was a Fuzzy's Bar shirt, which is a local biker bar here in town. Saber Roddy, the owner of Fuzzy's Bar, indicated to us that Cliff had been there a couple of nights prior to the discovery of his body in the river and that he was there with a, a female. Miss Roddy described the female to us as dark haired, wearing uh, black pants and a uh, white shirt with a dark colored jacket on. He came in at about seven, which is late for Cliff. And he had a girl with him I'd never seen before. She looked to be about my age and she had brown black hair, blunt cut. And what struck me about her, she seemed very nice at first, but she kept going to the restroom. She stayed in there for a long time. I asked Cliff if she was okay, and he said yes. And when he went to leave, he paid with cash, of course, and he had a big wad. When he did pull out that wad, I noticed she looked at it. Well, he'd just gotten a social security check, his disability check, and she knew that. I guarantee you she did. And as they were leaving, I told him to be careful going home. And he said, see you tomorrow. And that was the last time I saw Cliff. So four days into the investigation, we still don't know who this female with dark hair is. When uh, the sheriff at the time gives us a phone call that he had got a call from a local, uh, Mr. Randy Griffith, who possibly had information of who lit Mr. Carden's car on fire. Here I am leaving my house, going to a cookout. It's about 6, 6.30 p.m. And as I went around the curve, I seen a light shine on two people, and I realized one of them was Brian. I'm no Brian from all his life. Brian's mom's mom was married to my uncle. I feel like, you know, we're kin folk. Brian and this woman, which, you know, I didn't know if it was his girlfriend or what. I'd seen them together a few times. And I said, what y'all doing? He said, hey, we just been out walking. I said, a little cold to be walking. And uh, he said, hey, we just out getting exercise. Need to walk, bored. And I thought, what in the world? I knew something was up. Brian, you're not your normal self. But I said, well, I said, uh, can I give you a ride? And he said, yeah, take us to the motel. A few days later, me and my buddy is sitting talking, and my buddy tells me, he says, well, you know, the car was burnt right past your house. And I said, no, I didn't know that. He said, yeah, well, the car is burning up there, and Brian and his friend, they're walking from that area. That ain't a good sign. I said, no, that don't sound good at all. I need to call the sheriff. Brian Bettis is a local. He's about the same age I am. Went to school here, and I'd de I've dealt with Brian before. Brian was just a, a likable guy that got into some trouble every now and then with his friends when he was drinking. Randy Griffith said this is about where he picked up Brian Bettis and the unknown woman. The car was found burnt down this road, right here down this, this gravel road, straight ahead. Randy Griffith noted that Brian and the female were uh, muddy at the time, which where the car was burnt was muddy. As we're working the case, we wonder, was this mystery female that's with Brian Bettis, the same female that Mr. Carton's with at Fuzzy's Bar? We wanted to find Brian Bettis pretty quickly. At that point in time, they became suspect number one.
our focus became solely on Brian and the unknown female. We still don't know who this female with dark hair is, except that Mr. Carton's with the Fuzzy's Bar. Brian Bettis is a local, so we kind of grew up together. Brian was known to law enforcement. Brian had been in trouble, nothing major. Got into some trouble every now and then when he was drinking. Brian Bettis worked here for a few months. He was a dishwasher. He was kind of a cut up, actually, sometimes. But mostly, he was he was just kind of quiet. And the night of the murder, he uh, he came over and got some carryout food. And then again, the next day, he, he came back in and got breakfast and took it back to the room. I didn't really notice anything out of the ordinary. I talked to him just briefly. That was, that was about it. After trying to find Brian Bettis, we got contacted by uh, one of our local officers here. He owns a gas station. One of his workers, who's also a family member, had seen Brian Bettis come into the uh, gas station and purchase gas prior to us finding the car burnt and Mr. Carden's body. I have never shared my story about this on camera. I was always kind of too scared when he came after me. I happened to be reading the Dunlap Tribune, just as it was a small town newspaper here in town, and I was reading the article on it. I seen a, a news article of a murder. I told police that I had information about the murder. And they called me in for an interview. Brian Bates came in, asked me, somebody put gas in him. He said, yeah, he, he's had one of those, it don't matter what it is. Did you see a car or anything, or did you walk, or did you ride? I seen him walking. And then I seen him later that night, the kangaroo. He had scratched another ticket's off, and I looked over, and his facial hair was singed. Singed hair up to here, and his eyebrows were singed. Do you remember anything about him? Was that singed hair and stuff? I seen him blood on his pants. You seen blood? I was pretty sure it was blood. Okay. The information that Mr. Hobbs gave us gave us more evidence linking Brian Bettis to the homicide of Clifford Carton, Jr. Now we're starting to link Mr. Bettis with the car fire of our victims burning. Agent Wilson and myself were already trying to track down leads of where uh, Brian Bettis would be at. We started thinking about Randy Griffith's uh, statement to us. We go to the local motel in our town where Mr. Griffith says he dropped him off at, and we had them pull video up. We ended up finding video of Brian and this dark-haired female, the same female I described with Cliff at the Fuzzy's Bar. You see the car of Cliff Cardins. We can see them getting in and out, uh, carrying what could be nice car memorabilia, uh, walking into the hotel, the side doors. Uh, we see them checking in, laughing, joking, cutting up and having a good time. By watching the video footage, we learned that Brian and uh, the female checked into the hotel on February the 2nd, around 5 o'clock that night the day before the body was discovered. They spent three nights at the Dunlap Inn and then um, they went their separate ways. And it took them a fair amount of time to check out. They had a lot of stuff. The hotel told us that they had already cleaned their room um, and that there was no items left, but that they put their garbage in a garbage receptacle outside their building. So we started going through the garbage, pulling it out room by room, by bag by bag, laid it out at which point we found what we believed to be the bag of Brian Bettis' room. Jody found most significant was a pill bottle of Mr. Cardin's that had blood on it, and the pill bottle was then taken to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation Crime Lab in Nashville, and then the forensic scientists do the testing, and, and they found um, that it was Mr. Cardin's blood and DNA on the pill bottle. On this day, I'm out uh, trying to chase down where Mr. Bettis may be. We started finding out that Brian's not been seen in his family's residence or anything like that in a couple days. Later on, I get a phone call from Agent Wilson that Mr. Bettis is at the Justice Center turning himself in and uh, wants to be interviewed. We won't talk to you. I, I know you come in on your own. Uh, I always do, fellow. Yeah. Uh, no matter what the situation is, man, go and Brian's visibly shaking. He's kind of scared. I didn't do this. Brian Bettis gives us her name as Susan Baker. That's my neighbor, December 17th. Start talking, start dating. 
Somebody gave me another about seven or eight bucks. I mean, there's been times like where I left because she done something stupid, and every time that I left, she went to that dude's house. I would not know that because of All the puzzle pieces are starting to come together. This woman, Susan Baker, is dating two guys. She's dating Brian Bettis and Cliff Carden. So, you know, you got, you got a weird love triangle going on. Maybe she's the, the mastermind. Was Brian jealous that he found out Susan was dating Cliff and dating Brian at the same time? Maybe he shoots him out of jealousy. She calls me, and she's like, uh, we'll make some money, we'll make some money. And I said, yeah. Brian gives us his version of, it's all Susan Baker, it's Susan Baker's plan. He paints a picture of Susan as the mastermind and that she's got the gun and he's just doing what she's told to do. I was in the back seat. I was scared, dude. You know what I mean? I just wasn't doing you. You shot the head that far from me. His first statement is, is that she shot him. She shot him in the head. Are y'all going to protect me? I'm scared. So at this point in time, we're, we're all hands on deck trying to find Susan Baker. on February the 8th of 2011. We located Susan Baker at a residence over in Dallas Hollow in Hamilton County. We had her transported back to the sheriff's office. So at this point in time, Agent Wilson and myself, we have Susan Baker back at the Justice Center. Uh, and what, what kind of relationship did you have with Cliff? Uh, he was an older man. He paid attention to me, you know. He, uh, took me to Martin Beach, took me to Daytona 500, first time I've ever been to Florida, um, Gatlinburg, just took me trips, just spent money on me, you know, paid attention to Shows me. Shows you a little bit of love and affection. Yeah. For a long time, it was an always joy relationship. And then when it was up and on, we still talk, and then we get back together. Tell me the relationship with Brian. We had bought wedding rings. Pretty serious relationship. Right. During the interview with Miss Baker, she states that her and Brian had gone into an argument a couple of nights before the murder, and that she left there and went to Cliff Carden's house. Brian was jealous of Cliff. Every time we got into an argument, he'd always bring up Cliff's name. It would always come up, always. She starts telling us a story about how her and Cliff rode over to Dunlap to meet Brian at a store. Susan was at his house for three days prior to this because she told him that she needed a place to stay. Because he cares for people, he let her stay there, and then she led him to believe they were going to pick up a friend, which was Brian Bettis, who was her boyfriend. And he went into this not knowing or led to believe that this was just a friend that they were picking up. Brian Bettis was aware of what was what their purpose was. What happened from there? Brian, we rode around and went in back to the woods and... Oh, you went back in the woods, what happened? Shot. You shot him? Uh -huh. Who shot him? Her version was Brian pulled a gun out of nowhere and shot Mr. Card in the back of the head. During the interview, Agent Wilson and myself uh, were trying to determine Who's telling us the truth? The person that pulled the trigger on my dad should be in jail for life. Whoever they found out that done it, that would be the one detail that, that would convict them. Susan is giving us a story of how Brian is the one in the back seat, shoots him out of jealousy. Uh, Brian gives us a story of how Susan's the one that done it out of just pure evil. We start looking at what the evidence is telling us. Miss Baker, she tells us that Brian shoots Cliff in the back of the head, which we knew was a lie because the shot came from Beside his ear, so it's going to be a side shot, not a back shot. This was your idea. This was a whole setup. 
that you arranged for this, that you called Brian and asked him if he wanted to make some money the night before. And you go out there in the woods and you, you shot him. He's lying right there because I didn't know he had money. We start calling her out on some of her story that's not true. Why would Brian say that you told him you want to make some money? I didn't Everything so far Brian's told us has been the truth. Everybody on that mountain knew Cliff carried money on. They carried about two or three hundred dollars on it. So you knew at least you had two or three hundred dollars yeah. on it. We told Susan, we know you're lying. We know that you burnt the car, just trying to destroy the evidence. Uh, we told her that we know that y'all went to his house and robbed his house. We've got video of you and Brian Bettis at the hotel with the stolen NASCAR memorabilia. I think that's what started making Susan break down. Susan, here's the deal, okay? <clears throat> Brian didn't shoot Cliff, did he? You shot Cliff, didn't you? I mean, let's not lie anymore, okay? No. You, you shot Cliff from the passenger seat, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I snapped. I did. I snapped. I had it. And I didn't, I didn't even know if it was off safety or not. I didn't know. I didn't look at him when I done it. I didn't even know if he... She finally wants to give us a different version. Um, she asked me personally to pull my chair up next to her and she says, okay, pretend like you're driving. Put your hands up like you're driving. She says, well, I'm running the passenger seat. You grabbed my arm. Yeah, you grabbed your arm. Grabbed my arm, and I just went like this, and went, like that. Never in my time of doing interviews have I had somebody demonstrate this is how I killed him, and she stood up and used her hand to and made the noise pop. Let's see the shot clip. Basically, all he was was her sugar daddy. The trial has started for a woman charged with shooting and robbing her boyfriend of his prescription pills, dumping his body in the river, burning his car, and going on a spending spree with his money. Susan Baker was um, somebody that my dad had feelings for, he cared about, and then shoots him. He was helping her out of the kindness of his heart, and she took advantage of it. And it, what breaks my heart the most is that she did it for the money and his medication. In this whole case, Susan was the driving force. This was not Brian Bettis' plan. One of the things that, that bothered me, there was a photograph, a selfie taken of Clifford and Susan within an hour of her killing him. But they look like it's a, you know, a couple like all of us do take a picture with your spouse or, you know, significant other, or your kids or whatever. And, and within an hour, she shoots and kills him. I miss him a lot of times. It's like a loss for us here, especially for his mama. I mean, he was the most important thing in her life, and she was in his life, other than his wife and kid. She's not been the same since he was killed. I don't think she ever will be, neither. I never in my wildest dreams, I figured that if he was to ever go, he'd have another heart attack or, you know, just wished I could get that nice big hug again. What I miss most about my dad, the father-son talks. If I had the opportunity to talk to my dad, it would be, <laughs> uh, it would be to ask him advice on, on being a dad. When I do something with my boys, it's in the back of my mind. It's a thought process of, is this something that my dad would do, or would he be proud of it? Uh, then that's where I, I find my, my peace with it.